Hello. All right. We are live. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our November 1st Care Together. It is already November. We are getting close to the end of the year, and this is a really um, uh, exciting time to not only be here as, the t as we get towards the end of the year and the holidays and being with family and thinking about those times, but we also um, have a couple more Care Togethers and, and really important topics. Um, and as somebody who is curating and often host the Care Togethers, it's an exciting time because this is um, an important topic that uh, I, I recently have understood a little bit more um, personally as a father. And I know that this is a topic that is um, not talked about a lot. There's a lot of stigma attached to it. And fortunately, we have somebody connected to our network who not only uh, was the program manager at NAMI Orange County at one time, she was also part of the team that created Care Together in the very beginning um, in 2020. So we're excited to have a guest host, a special guest host specifically um, on this topic that is a little bit out of my skis, as they say, as a, mm. as a male, as a father, even though I, I can understand in, in an in a, a indirect way as, as a parent and as a dad, but um, it's really important that we have um, proper representation in the subjects that we cover with individuals that have lived experience and can talk with more insight on that. And so we are excited that we are um, all here together to talk about postpartum anxiety and depression. Although, again, I keep on saying excited as it's good. I mean, I'm excited that, that we are talking about this, that this is something that we can begin to um, eliminate the stigma around um, this topic. And, and that's the goal of, of NAMI Orange County and NAMI in general is to eliminate the stigma of mental illness in our communities and to do things like this, like having discussions around topics like this. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do some housekeeping before I pass it over to our co-host, Shivani. Um, I just want to let everybody know that this is a webinar, so we won't be able to see your faces, unfortunately. It'll just be the, the two um, uh, guests and the panelists. I'll, I'll be here, but I'll also be um, putting my camera off uh, and let the conversation go between Lagaya and Shivani. Uh, but if you do have a question at any point, feel free to click on the Q&A button, the question and answer button. You can ask your questions there. You can also use the chat button to, to talk directly to the panelists if you do have a question. The best way is the Q&A button. It's a little bit more direct and we can read it a lot easier than um, oftentimes it's hard to scroll if there's a lot of questions on the chat to keep up with everything. But I also wanna thank the NAMI Orange County Executive Board and the Executive Committee for um, really pushing for uh, Care Together, for it to be uh, something important that they're excited and interested in doing topics that um, speak to issues that our society is dealing with. And right now, especially relating to diversity and inclusion, and we appreciate that these are all issues that NAMI Orange County cares about. And we look forward to developing more content like this in the future. And also the county, the Orange County Health Association for uh, supporting us and what we do here with our Care Together Forum. So we might be new to our forums and what Care Together is. And what CARE stands for is cultivating awareness, respect, empowerment together. And our mission is to honor and invite cultural awareness and promote inclusivity through shared experience while reducing the stigma that surrounds mental health. And our vision is to encourage allyship through engagement, self-reflection, and self-awareness in the Orange County community. So a lot of our Care Togethers uh, focus on a topic. We have a long-form discussion, and we also have question and answer time at the very end as well. So we'll also have some uh, resources that we will share via email and also on the screen that have to do with this topic of postpartum anxiety and depression that you can connect with um, after as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to, um, I'm gonna say, say the, the bios and then I'll pass it over to Shivani. So our, our guest today is Lagaya Lang. She was born and raised in San Clemente, California in Orange County. She attended college at UC Berkeley and graduated with a BA in mass communications. After graduating, Lagaya moved to Los Angeles to pursue her master's degree at USC. After graduating with an MA in communication management, Lagaya began her career in the entertainment industry, working for 20th Century Fox. There she met her husband and they married in 2018 and had a 
daughter, Madeline Maddie, in 2020. After her daughter was born, her struggle with postpartum anxiety and OCD made her want to spread awareness on the topic of maternal mental health. In 2022, she started her podcast, Lagaya Means Happiness, which is, uh, I believe, Tagalog. Um, right, Lagaya? Yes, correct. Yep. Yes, so as she is uh, has a Filipino background. Uh, to talk openly about her journey. Lagaya currently works at the Walt Disney Studio and lives in Elisa Viejo with her husband and daughter. So hello, Lagaya. Hi. Hi, thank you for having me. And then I'll, I'll pass it. Um, next is our host, uh, Shivani. Um, and Shivani is registered yoga and mindfulness guide and works with individuals one-on-one -on -one or in a group settings to find healthy ways to manage their mental health. Through her own personal struggles with mental health and anxiety and postpartum depression and anxiety more recently, she found herself wanting to help others navigate their own mental health, including mothers, because enough support is not given to them during these challenging times. And I must say, uh, before I hand it off to her, to toot her horn a little bit, because I know a little bit of a background of her leadership style. Uh, part of the reason that we're here and doing this on Zoom is because of uh, Shivani's leadership in 2020 of pivoting really quickly. We were one of the first NAMI's uh, affiliates in, in the United States to do things on Zoom. I think we, we shut down in March of 2020 and we did things in April of 2020, uh, even before NAMI National had their uh, outline of what they were gonna do for uh, Zoom and, and things online. So um, we are grateful that uh, her for her leadership and we're glad that she's here back again, hosting our care together on this topic. So I'll pass that to Shivani. And again, I will put my camera off and I'll answer any NAMI related questions. And I'll also um, put a little link to our survey that I'll put in at the end. And I might chime in at the end as well to say goodbye, but I'll, I'll pass it over to Shivani. Thank you, Ed. Um, and I just wanted to first start off by saying thank you to NAMI for allowing me to come back. Um, again, Care Together has a very special place in my heart because it is one program that I helped start and create. Um, it was really one of the programs that I thought was really necessary for our community as a way to bring people together, shared experiences together, but also bring the component of learning and education um, around certain topics and topics that have stigma associated with them. So I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm excited to host this panel because um, I have personal experience, but also have family members that have gone through a lot with their maternal mental health. And um, it's always been something that I'm really passionate about. Um, one of the biggest reasons why it was something that has a very special place in my heart is because of um, losing a very close friend of mine um, to postpartum depression. Um, it was in August of 2020, where essentially one of our really great friends um, and actually a childhood friend of my husband's um, lost her battle with postpartum depression. And since that experience, uh, prior to me even having my son, um, I knew that in honor of her, I wanted to continue to drive more awareness around these topics, uh, to talk about it more. And essentially, here we are um, in honor of all of those individuals who unfortunately are not here to share their story. Um, I think we can say that we're here to just share, educate, and bring more awareness around this topic. So without further ado, I would love to really just start off the conversation by if Lagaya can share her story um, and just a little bit about what you experienced um, regarding your um, maternal mental health post having your daughter. I think that would be a great place to start. Okay, hi, um, Shivani and everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, a little nervous, but happy to be here just the same. Um, yeah, I uh, uh, was a first time mom in 2020 and I gave birth to my daughter right in the middle of COVID in August of 2020. And um, I had kind of prepared for 
uh, what my postpartum experience might be like because I've struggled with anxiety and panic disorder for over 20 years now. And so I did go to the UCLA, um, I guess their maternal mental health program. And I went and saw some doctors about, you know, preparing and, and seeing like what type of medication I should be taking. And, you know, just really like trying to get into the mode of preparing for you know, trying to prevent, I guess you could say, having postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression. And they basically told me, nope, just stay on your medication that you're on. Everything's fine. Let us know if anything goes wrong. And I was kind of surprised that that was it, you know? And so I went off and on my merry way and had my daughter. And sure enough, within about three weeks, I was still having, I guess, what they would call the baby blues. And the nurses did come into my room, like on my third day after my C-section to talk about the baby blues and postpartum depression. And they had like this worksheet, like this sort of, you know, worksheet that they go through with you to talk to you about your mental health and they do it, you know, and they were very, very good. I mean, I liked the nurses at the, in the recovery unit at UCLA and they were sort of talking about, you know, if it goes past three weeks let the pediatrician know, let your general practitioner know it could be postpartum depression. At this point, I had never heard of postpartum anxiety or postpartum OCD. I'd never heard of either of them. Um, I thought it was just postpartum depression. And so after about three weeks, I did um, suffer from like an adjustment disorder sort of anxiety. And I was so afraid I would get postpartum, I think, that I almost brought it on, if, if that makes sense. And I was so nervous and I was at home with this new little baby and I didn't understand my role as a mother. I just, you know, I had spent 37 years of my life free and independent and working in my career. And now all of a sudden I had this tiny little human that I was responsible for. And I was very taken off guard and it was like postpartum hit me like a truck and I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my friends. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell my husband. I didn't, you know, I said, it must be the baby blues. It's going to go away. It's going to go away. And by like three or four weeks in, it just didn't go away and it wasn't really depression. So I didn't know what it was. It was like, I was, I was getting out of bed. I was doing everything I needed to do, but I was completely nervous and worried all the time. And I started to have this worry about what, if I hurt my baby, you know, or what if I hurt myself, which I learned later is a symptom of postpartum OCD you get these intrusive thoughts about possibly hurting yourself or your baby. But at this point, I'd never heard of postpartum OCD. So I looked, you know, near and far for resources for help. And luckily, my mother-in-law moved in and helped us with the baby while I found a perinatal psychiatrist that I could talk to. And I was really fortunate to be, you know, to have a supportive husband and a supportive family and to be near USC and UCLA and Cedar sinai and UCLA Hospital and like all these resources that you can go to. And um, like about a month or two into my postpartum anxiety, I found out what it was, you know, the definition of postpartum anxiety. And I was like, oh, that totally fits me. That's what I'm going through and OCD. And they actually emphasize the OCD in my case, because I was having so many intrusive thoughts about what if I hurt my baby? What if I hurt myself? Things I had never done in my past, yet I was worried about doing all of a sudden. And it made it so that I was afraid to be around my baby. Like, I just didn't want to be near my baby. I wanted, you know, I did want to be with her, but I just was afraid to be with her. And it was a very strange feeling. And I did not know what to do. And I was devastated, really. I was devastated and I was desperate for help. And my mind was going a million miles a minute and I had anxiety and these intrusive thoughts. It was awful. And I found my way to an IOP at the Mission Hospital Laguna Beach that was luckily doing um, virtual sessions over Zoom. And I was able to do that. And to make a very long story short, um, within about three months, I recovered 
because my medication was adjusted and I was able to get this group therapy, even though it wasn't in person, it was over Zoom. And it was group therapy that included time with your baby as well. So you would bring your baby into the session with you and do this like, you know, try to bond, have this bonding experience with your child. So I owe a lot to that IOP at Mission Hospital because they were really able to help me and they stabilized my medications and they explained to me what I had. But I mean, this was a world that I just wasn't aware of at all when I was pregnant, when I was expecting my daughter. I had no idea about postpartum anxiety and OCD at all. I didn't know about what resources to go to. And, and the, any advice that I ever give anybody on this is just leave no stone unturned. You know, when you're not feeling well, there are resources out there. Unfortunately, they're kind of hard to come by, which is why we're here this evening. Um, but you, you have to do everything in your power to get better because there are resources out there to help you. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that story. I know that sharing something so deeply personal and frankly traumatic can be really difficult to share. So thank you so much. Um, you touched on a lot of important points. And one thing that I want to sort of touch on first is this idea about, huh, there's a lot that I want to touch on because you, you had a lot to share, but one of the things I want to, where I want to start is really at that pregnancy stage. Um, I think that so much emphasis when you are pregnant is around the mother. How are you feeling? You know, um, when you go to your appointments, it's about like, you know, managing symptoms. If you are having certain symptoms during your pregnancy, um, getting that support that you need. And then as soon as you have that baby, <laughs> it is like the tables turn <laughs> to the other side. Um, I myself am just probably five days short of six months of having my son with us in this world. And uh, six months ago, even though I had my experience and understanding of what postpartum depression um, and anxiety look like, I knew when I was experiencing it that it was, in fact, postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, I had a history with, with my depression and anxiety, and I knew that this was different, but it was, it was something that was so all consuming. And I was so frustrated because I felt like as soon as I had the baby, everyone's focus went directly to the baby and he was fine. Um, he still is, <laughs> and he's doing really well, but the amount I had to advocate for myself not only at, you know, at my doctor's office or for my postpartum follow-ups, but even within my own family unit, it just felt more overwhelming. It felt like more of an undertaking to be, to have to explain, I need, I need some time or I need some, some, I need like a break or whatever it is, right? You're, you're navigating this new chapter of becoming a mother and to, to have people completely just not even, I don't even need, I didn't even need people to ask me how I was doing, but I need people to understand that if I'm sitting there having dinner and I just start crying yeah, <laughs> like, to just let me cry. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it would just be nice if I could just get a hug versus being like, why are you crying? You have a healthy baby. You should be so grateful. That is the last thing that anyone wants to hear when, when you are literally feeling like so overwhelmed, sleep deprived, and trying to navigate this new identity as a mother. So just being six months into my journey of motherhood, I can tell you that I am still going through and navigating the different tools that I need to, to move past this experience. Um, but, but what I can say is I know that the advocating that I did for myself very early on, whether that's, you know, seeking the right 
therapist to be able to navigate this entire thing to advocating for myself with family members to making sure that I can, you know, reach out to, to certain friends to help have other people that I can lean on and trust has got me to a point now where at six months, I can talk about my experience. Um, but I know that I'm still myself in, in the thick of it, if you will. Um, I wanted to sort of go into the piece that you talked about of when you talked about leaving no st stone unturned. And I would love to hear your experience on this because I can definitely share mine. Um, but the postpartum, I think the postpartum follow-ups that were given, um, you know, in hospital were very much very soon after birth, right? It was, it was right after, it was right before you leave the hospital and it was at your six week follow-up appointment. I was already diagnosed by my six week appointment with postpartum anxiety and depression, but I felt like once it was diagnosed and once my OB talked to me about what my options were for treatment, that was it. <laughs> I didn't get any other follow-up. I had to be the person that stays consistent with my therapy, that recognizing that if something that we worked on or something that was discussed in my treatment plan wasn't not working for me, I had to be the one advocating for it. So I don't know. I would love to hear your experience with that um, because I think where I'm currently at right now is just feeling a little bit of letdown <laughs> in our system, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that so much emphasis is put on, you know, the pregnancy and ta taking such good care of you. Like you have weekly appointments towards the end of your pregnancy and then that's it. <laughs> it just all goes away after you have your baby. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the leaving no stone unturned, um, cause I guess I finished my story at when I recovered from the initial postpartum, unfortunately my postpartum came back. Um, I don't know if you've probably heard of this, but you know, you can get better and then the symptoms can come back, you know, and I had a lot of changes in my life happen all at the same time and my anxiety flared up and my postpartum came back and all of these intrusive thoughts came back like four months after. So now we're into 2021 and my baby is like seven or eight months old at this point. And I was sick again, you know, and I wondered, you know, had I ever really been better or had I just sort of staved it off? Like, I didn't really know. And when you talk about having your therapist, you know, I had had a therapist for 15 years in Los Angeles where I used to live and he knew me better than like anyone in the world, probably at that point. And unfortunately I had to stop practicing right about the time that this happened. So I had to find a new therapist, doctors, um, new help. And I had already gone through an IOP. So I like just didn't know what to do. So I went back to the same IOP and went into their program again, not maternal mental health, but just mental health this time for anxiety. And they diagnosed me again with postpartum anxiety and postpartum OCD. And unfortunately, my story is a really long one of, uh, it includes going to a residential treatment facility for 30 day stay. I did that. I unfortunately did not know what to do. I didn't know where to turn. Um, and at one point my anxiety was so bad. I actually went to the emergency room and insisted that they admit me into the behavioral health unit. That was totally not what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like club med and all the doctors were going to like take care of you. And it was going to be this like really nice experience. And it was very scary, actually, like you said, traumatic. And so after that, it was like, I white knuckled my way, just trying to feel better and take care of my daughter for the next few months until I finally went to a second, third residential experience because one didn't work out. And I went to a third where they finally were able to stabilize my medication and help me with my issues. And it was a very long road for me. And I felt like, oh my goodness, you know, 
all of this can happen to me, this person that had had anxiety and panic, but like you would never know it to look at me or to watch me or to see my accomplishments in my life. You know, I was very accomplished and driven and, um, you know, a type A personality. And here I am completely knocked down by postpartum and not knowing where to go, you know, just like who to call, what kind of doctor, what kind of therapist is going to stick with me through all of this? You know, I was lucky to finally find a therapist after maybe like three or four or five I had tried. And you really have to like your therapist. You have to have a good relationship with them and they invest in you and you invest in them. And like, it's kind of like that partnership that gets you through things. And I just didn't feel like I had that until later on in my journey. And, um, you know, it's just like what you said, it's like suddenly, you know, you have the baby and all of the, and I had several people tell me, how can you be upset? You know, you have a perfect baby. How can you not, oh, this is my, how can you not love your child? That is one of the worst thing you can say to a mother that is going through postpartum. You have no idea how much she loves her child. You know, she loves her child so much that she doesn't want to touch her child in case she does something to the child. She doesn't, her mind, like my mind just wasn't working right. And I didn't know how to make it right. I just knew that there was something very, very wrong. And, you know, leaving no stone unturned, you know, I was willing to walk through fire to get better. I didn't care what I had to do. That's why I went to the hospital. That's why I went to residential. That's why I left my family for 30 days for treatment. I mean, my journey was difficult, but at the end of the day, I got better. I got what I needed and I'm here at home and I'm, you know, happy with my family again. And, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but you really have to like dig and it shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. I don't think it's that way in other countries, and but that's a whole other discussion. But the way it is in our country, it makes it so difficult for the mother to find help. And it should not be that way. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with what you had to say. And I, not only is it so difficult postpartum for a mother to find the correct care or the support. Um, I think, I also think that because the fact that this topic of maternal mental health is something that is not discussed or talked about often, um, when you are going through it, you truly feel like you are alone. Okay. You feel like you're on this island of like just turmoil and you don't even know there's no one there giving you a life raft. (laughs) Everyone is just like, you're on your own. You should be fine. You should be happy with your baby. You know, you should be grateful. Never once am I not grateful to have my son. And I don't think any mother or parent is not grateful to have their child. But when you are, when you're having that internal battle and And on top of that, for women post-delivery, when you're going through that big dip in hormones that are at peak for nine months, which is a long time, to then have things dip really, really low and then try to find some sort of stability after that, that all takes so much time. And none of that is discussed ahead of time. It's just like, you'll experience a little bit and everything will be fine. They don't tell you that, you know, some days you can feel like you just want to crawl into a hole and not come out. Like that is truly sometimes how you can feel. Um, And sometimes you just feel like you, not even that you don't love your child, but you're, you're just like, somebody needs to help me and take, take this baby because I need to just like, think like, I cannot think, you know, if I'm constantly being you know, pulled in these different directions. Um, So I think the biggest issue is that this topic is one, not discussed enough. Two, I think that the 
I go back to the system <laughs> because um, it's not something that is, unless you're, you're telling, and I, I don't re recall how many times in within that six, six week period of recovery that I called my doctor and I told her something is wrong. I just don't feel right. Um, and it was like, I remember having a nurse, uh, the nurse pick up at one point And I said, I want to speak to my doctor. You know, they're never going to let you really, unless it's like an emergency. And the, the response that I got, which was really frustrating for me was you shouldn't feel this way. You're like a couple weeks in, you should be fine. And that was something that really wow. one, immediately I started crying. <laughs> and two, my response back was, but I know something is wrong and I know myself better than you. So I would love to speak to my <laughs> provider, please, because I need to find help, right? Like yeah. I, I need to figure out how to work on my recovery. And it was, it was definitely, it was definitely a battle and a challenge. And I think that that is something I think for our healthcare providers, it needs to be brought to the forefront a little bit more as much as the care and the, the level of like care that you receive while you're pregnant should be the same, if not more for mothers for a extended period of time postpartum okay. to help with whatever might be going on. Um, not only did I have my own issues with, with mental health stuff, but I also had physical recovery that was really yeah. difficult. Um, and a couple of my friends who, uh, who also had babies around the same time did not have that aspect. Um, and so I felt really, really down about just where I was in my recovery. Why was I having to go through so much struggle? Um, and it was, it was challenging. Like you said, it was, it was a hard journey and I'm still in it. So I am definitely every day is a challenge. Um, and I'm still trying to find how to navigate my diagnosis and my recovery. But one thing is for sure is as much as I've prioritized my son, I'm also prioritizing myself um, because I feel like it's only fair for my son to have the best version of me. And if that means that I need to call on family members or friends or whatever it is to help me, that's what's going to happen. Um, and in the beginning, I felt guilty about it. And Lagaya, I would love to hear like, if you've experienced any feelings of, of guilt. And I think as mothers, we experience what they call mom guilt very often. Oh, uh, yes. But I, I would love to hear, you know, kind of your, your thoughts on that. I mean, um, yeah, when my postpartum anxiety really got bad, like I'd say a month into um, my daughter being born, um, we had to reach out to my mother-in-law and she was luckily because of COVID. Um, and it was also difficult in COVID, right? Because I couldn't have friends over and go see friends and go to mommy and me groups and go to anything in person for support. I felt like I was really alone, like on an island. And I didn't want my husband to have to do everything. I wanted to be a mother and take care of my daughter, but I just felt awful. And I finally just like broke down and cried one night and told my husband, you know, I'm really not doing well, really. Like I'm telling you it's bad. And so we, luckily my mother-in-law is a teacher and she had the time off because of COVID. And so, and it was summer. So she was able to come stay with us. And I kept having these guilty feelings and I would always like thank her and tell her like, thank you so much for doing this. And she kept saying like, we are a family. This is what we do in, in normal circumstances. I would have helped you anyway, you know, and it makes you think about other cultures and how they just rally around the mother. You know, I think in China, she stays in bed for 40 days or something while she's just taken care of. 
And I just felt so guilty because I'm such a capable woman and I've been such a leader in my life and in my career. And I've always been the one that like, you know, organizes events and gets everybody motivated and does, and here I am, I can't take care of my daughter. I felt so unlike myself, you know, I just felt like I didn't know myself and I felt like I needed so much help. Like every day I needed help from my husband, I need help from a therapist, I need help from a doctor, I need help from a mother-in-law. And I felt really guilty asking for that help, but I got used to it because I had to, like, there was nothing else I could do. I needed that help at that time. And I just, you know, they say, give yourself grace. They always say, give yourself grace. And I think I am the worst at giving myself grace. I'm just not good at that, you know? And I think that's something that you should do as well. And like, you probably are told, you know, give yourself grace. And we're like, okay, give myself grace. Thank you very much. I need to get better now. Thank you. How do I get better? <laughs> you know, and you're just, and I'm just, I wasn't good at it. You know, it was so hard, but to accept yeah. help, it was hard. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely hard. And I have to also agree with you about the the differences in culture. Um, I know that my mom, we're, we come from a South Asian background and my mom said, Typically, um, it's extended family that cares for the baby and the mother's only responsibility is her recovery. Like everyone prepares foods for the mother. The mother is just there resting, recovering because it is a big deal to have a baby. Um, it is a big toll that it takes on your body. Um, and, and unfortunately, because of our go, go, go. You always have to be doing something and going from one thing to another here in the U S I think it's really easy to feel really guilty about taking the time out for yourself, especially during a big, big, big event, like having a baby. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely I've had my share of trying to transition back into work just after three months of having a baby, which is in my opinion, not enough time. I was not ready to return and I still am not ready to be back at work. Um, but you know, mothers are other mothers are, I think heroes, unsung heroes, because we will, we will put aside everything of how we feel and we will try to keep all the plates in the air. Um, and it's been a tough, tough road. Um, like I said earlier, I'm still in recovery myself. And so each day I'm finding either new challenges or um, new things that are coming up for me, whether that's, you know, feeling guilty about one, going back to work and not being there for my son as much as I would like to, um, relying on, you know, family and friends to help me out. Um, because I feel very similar to you, Lagaya. I'm an independent person. I can do it by myself. So why is it so hard? And why do I need to call upon all of this help? But I, I, the one thing that I think I try to keep reminding myself is you need to do this so that you can be the best mother for your son. And it's okay to ask for help. Um, and, and with that, I think I want to start to pivot our conversation a little bit into sharing a little bit about when you, when you recovered. And I think recovery is, is a, a journey, right? I think we're always working towards where we would like to be and always growing as people. But I would love to just talk a little bit about like any inspiration or hope through your own journey that you can share with our audience here um, tonight. If they are going through it, if they have been through it, if someone they know a loved one is going through it, what can we do to support someone that we love or even ourselves? Um, if Because a lot of times we have to advocate for ourselves. Well, I think advocating for yourself is one of the things that you can do um, and having just a supportive network around you, if that can be like two people to 10 people, but you have to have people that you trust that you can talk to about how you're feeling. 
and that won't judge you. And you cannot go through it alone. You, you, you can feel like you're on an island, but you can't be on an island because you absolutely need support. And I think the best thing that someone can do for someone who's going through this is just remind them that this is temporary and that everything is temporary and anxiety and depression. And, and, you know, these are feelings they, um, you choose how you engage with these things. You know, you have power, even though you feel like you don't, you know, you can empower yourself just by reminding yourself that it's up to you, how you engage with these feelings that you're having. And when you're having intrusive thoughts, they're just thoughts. That's something that's very useful that you can tell somebody when they're having intrusive thoughts, which actually happens very, very often in postpartum. Moms have these horrible thoughts, like whether it's like, what if I hurt my baby? What if I hurt myself? What, whatever. What if I hurt someone else in the family? And they're, they're not going to do that. They have no intention of carrying that out. They just have these thoughts. And the best thing to say to that is they're just thoughts. It's up to you how you engage. They're just feelings. It's up to you how you engage and it's temporary. And I feel like those are the things that got me through the most is just being reminded that how I was feeling was temporary and that you get through everything. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why I always say like, leave, I'm saying it again, but leave no stone unturned in terms of getting support and figuring out, you know, who your support system is going to be so that you don't feel so alone. Yeah, no, thank you. I think to add to that too is, my advice um, is also to not feel guilty about having certain boundaries yeah. around your recovery. I think you come first, your family comes first. And I think whether or not, you know, it is your family that is in your, in your circle, or if it's friends that are in your circle, but like Lagaya said, find those people that will be there and be your champions but also be able to maybe communicate with them how they could be useful, right? So when I reach out to the individuals that I have in my close network of, of people and my support system, sometimes I'll just say, hey, you know what, today I'm having a really, really bad day and I really just need to get some stuff off my chest. Do you mind just listening to what I have to say? Um, and that has been a huge help for me to be able to, to share what I've been going through. Sometimes it's just the act of just being able to, to, to like word vomit everything that's going on yeah. um, and share like why I'm feeling a certain way or why I'm feeling so overwhelmed and hearing like, Hey, you know what, what you're going through, it's a lot, it's a lot for anyone. Um, and someone, if you, if you are able to like preface that conversation then it doesn't feel hard for the per, per person on the other end, but it also doesn't feel hard for you either because now the other person is actually listening versus trying to help you solve a problem. Because oftentimes when you are in the thick of depression or anxiety um, and you are also going on lack of sleep or you know just constantly being on all day long, whether it's work or, you know, taking care of your baby or being asked my favorite question in the planet is what are we eating for lunch and dinner? And I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> um, so I'm like, I'll figure it out. Um, you know, and it's just, instead of having to be a problem solver, you can just say like, you know what, <laughs> I just need to get some things off my chest. So as we kind of start to, to kind of close this conversation. Um, I think the guy, you gave a really great tip on, you know, making sure that you're able to, to kind of support you, not only yourself, but others. Um, I, the thing that I would like to add is don't be afraid to actually take, take your own, you know, mental health and your own health in your own hands, because to be honest, <laughs> and it's really, I know it's, it's kind of like twofold. It will sound kind of like very negative, but also positive when I say this, but 
you are really the only person that knows yourself really well. And we are the hardest on ourselves than we are on anyone else. And as much care and concern as you would maybe give your best friend, if they had come to you with this, whatever you're experiencing, give that same care and concern to yourself. And I cannot tell you how much that will help just make it easier for you to find the right people uh, to keep in your network and the right ways to ask for help and find the help that is needed. Um, there, there, there are so many different journeys and there are so many different ways that people find their journey or the, the end to their journey, right? Whether it's through therapy, through medication, through friends and family, whatever it is, I think it's so important to not be afraid. And I, I love your term, Ligaya, of leaving no stone unturned. Um, so I'm going to leave it with don't leave any stones unturned. If you need the help, there are so many resources now out there that can provide that for you, even virtually. Um, and so we'll share those um, resources. I'll, I'll definitely share them in, in a little bit, but I think this would be a great, great place for us to pause and see if the audience has any questions for us, specifically Ligaya, our guest today. Um, anything we're open, I think you can, you can ask it in the Q and A portion or even the chat. And I think Ed will kind of monitor those. The, oh, to the link right now to the survey as well. But yes, any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, um, we'd love to get some feedback or get some questions. In the meantime, while we wait for some questions, I'll definitely go ahead and share our resources page with you all for you to see. Um, one I do want to talk through is these are a lot of the postpartum um, resources that Ligaya and I put together for you all today. Um, and one of them is uh, one that is virtual. The very first one is Postpartum Support International. Um, they are a great organization. They have helplines and they have support groups. They have education. Um, it's all run by licensed um, individuals and healthcare providers that are putting maternal mental health into the forefront. And, and they have some really exciting things that they're working on as well. Um, and it's a great resource for you to check out because a lot of their stuff majority of their stuff, unless you're a provider taking a course is free. So I did want to mention that. And we do have some local resources like Mission Hospital of Laguna Beach, their maternal mental health and wellness program, as well as Hogue Hospital. They also have a maternal mental health program. Um, they're building out their program in Newport Beach and in Irvine. So there are a couple different locations that they have that you can check out. And then of course, there's a UCLA maternal mental health program as well. Um, and and Ligaya was kind enough to provide us with some podcasts, um, if that is your jam. Um, and Ligaya has her own podcast, which is awesome. So um, she has different topics that she shares. Um, and these are great resources and um, podcasts to check out. So please check them out. And we will also be sending these in an email. Um, so you can definitely, you know, you don't have to write everything down now. We'll also go ahead and send them to you. Ed, do we have any questions? Yes, you have two questions. Uh, one is from Michelle. She said, do you think there is a correlation between being type A and anxiety? Do you have any theories as to what makes someone inclined to be anxious? Is it a chemical thing or a combination of everything? I think that's a great question. Yeah. And I think that if, I will let Ligaya answer first. <laughs> um, well, I think that 
it's definitely chemical, but you know, I will say that a lot of things can be brought on by life changes and circumstances. So I think if you're predisposed to anxiety because you have a history of it in your family, like I did, I actually have anxiety on one side of my family and I had anxiety and panic going into my pregnancy. So that made me more, more predisposed towards having postpartum, I think. And, um, you know, there, and then there's also like, um, Shivani was saying that huge drop in, um, hormones that happens after you have a baby that can make you a little wonky, <laughs> but I definitely think that, you know, it can either, it can, I definitely think part of it is chemical, um, but it can also be situational and it can also just have to do with what's going on in your life. And I think you should always just look into your family and your family's history and what is there. And that will probably help you map out, you know, how predisposed you are to certain, to certain illnesses and certain, you know, mental health issues. Yeah. And just to add to that too, in, in, addition to the chemical imbalance that, uh, that occurs, your body is always changing. Um, and unfortunately our life is life, right? Things are just going to continuously be stacked on us. And sometimes it takes something big, like having a baby or falling pregnant, or this can be a whole nother can of worms. We can have a whole other topic on, but even the conception process isn't easy. I suffered two losses. And so my entire pregnancy this third time was anxiety ridden. I was afraid that at any moment something can go horribly wrong again. And I think that that was a huge reason as to why, you know, I suffered through a lot of the initial anxiety and, and depression that I had. Um, and, and I kept trying to tell myself, well, you should be grateful that, you know, he, um, that you've, you, you have a baby now you've met your baby on the other side. Right. But I was also like nervous. I had a little bit of that. I woke up, like, what if something goes wrong again? Um, so I think like, uh, beyond just there being an imbalance, I think there also is the culmination of all of our different experiences that we have, whatever our journey is can also add to that. So, and I think that's sort of going to answer the next question, which is um, also asked about, does postpartum depression sometimes lead into PTSD because of the surprise about having postpartum depression? And I feel like I can, I definitely feel like oftentimes we don't expect ourselves to experience postpartum depression. We just we, and again, it's not talked about enough either. So, so we don't expect to have certain things happen to us. And then when they do, it's difficult. It's a difficult journey to be on. Um, and so Ligaya, I don't know if you have any, anything to add to that as well, but sometimes I do think that having, especially if you're not educated around the topic prior to it happening to you, it can be really difficult to navigate as well as manage on your own. I like lit up when that question came up because I have PTSD from the year of struggle. I would say 2021 was my year of struggle. And I had, no, I mean, going to the hospital, going to a residential, leaving your family for 30 days, having to go to that length to try to get better and get treatment, I was traumatized. I really was. And I, you know, I went through it because I, like I said earlier, I would walk through fire to get better and come back to my family. But that's what I did. I feel like I, like theoretically I walked, I did walk through fire and <laughs> I came out and luckily I'm okay. But I do definitely believe that what you go through during your postpartum process, if you're going through a difficult time with depression, anxiety, or OCD, or one or two or three all together, which can happen, you know, um, you can definitely get PTSD from that experience. And that's something that you need to be grace, you know, give yourself grace about as well. And you have to honor the fact 
that you went through what you went through and you need to give yourself whatever space and time you need to recover from that. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other thing we could talk about. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's two almost same questions that I'm seeing here. One is in the chat and then one is in the Q and a, which is about whether there was something that the nursing staff or labor and delivery nurses could have done better to support us in terms of our recovery um, or helping get connected to resources? Or is it just spending more time with us to feel like our qu questions and concerns are being heard? Because I, because this is so fresh for me, <laughs> um, I, I, I will kind of take a first you know, stab at answering this question, but I, I do believe that I appreciated that, that the screenings were done for postpartum and that I, like there was some sort of conversation about postpartum um, at the hospital before I left. But I do know too that it felt like my it felt like whatever I was going through and whatever I was experiencing, it was like, okay, it's, it, this is normal. You'll be fine. We just need to let you go home and, and like start, you know, leading your life as a mother and you'll be okay. I think for, I think, especially when I was calling back <laughs> to say, Hey, you know, like this is not just a two week thing. Like I'm really not feeling like myself. Um, or even a version of myself, I think it would have been really nice to, to have someone point me in the right direction in terms of, you know, like making it feel like it wasn't a burden that I was calling them to say that something was wrong. Um, and instead saying, I totally understand. And, you know, I don't know what resources you may have looked into already, but having like a provider tell you like, here are some of the other places that you can look, I think would, would have been really beneficial versus just being like, well, we can just, you know, we can just do this and we can check in on you. If you feel, if you don't feel like yourself, you can just make an appointment again. And it was almost like it was put back on me versus mm -hmm. sometimes it's really hard when you're in those really dark moments to want to reach out to get help. So it would have been nice to, to have a provider call and, and, you know, in a couple of weeks to ask, ask how I was doing. One thing I do want to share though, that I found really beneficial and I found through my own research is I called my insurance company and asked, um, what kind of resources they have for maternal mental health. And actually Aetna has a really great program um, for, it's, it's like a six, week, six to eight week program postpartum where you get assigned a, both a therapist and a life coach. And you essentially work with these individuals for that eight weeks to talk about whatever challenges you're going through. So I would highly recommend, and it's completely free. Um, and I didn't know about it until I called. So I would highly recommend like looking into places that you never even thought, because there are so many resources out there and so many places you can go. You just have to find them, unfortunately, but because I just happened to fall upon this program by chance, I just wanted to share that that is another place you can go to is calling your insurance company and asking if they have any programs internally that you as an insurance holder of their insurance can participate in as well. And then Lagai, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but I know we're at time. So I do wanna be mindful of everyone's time here tonight, but I do wanna give you a chance to kind of wrap up and also just thank everyone uh, for coming tonight, uh, for being a part of this conversation. And hopefully this is not the first and last time that we're here. Uh, to be able to share these um, stories and, and resources with. Yeah, no, um, I thank you for having me. I'm so glad that we're doing this. I think destigmatizing the conversation around maternal mental health and perinatal 
mood disorders, you know, postpartum. Um, it's just something that we, we as like a country really need to focus on. And um, it starts with us, you know, it starts with these types of conversations. And I wanted to also say um, that last question. Um, I, I agree with Shivani, you have to call your insurance company and find out what kind of resources that they have available for you because it's amazing what they'll cover. Um, especially in terms of, um, you know, I had to go as far as residential and insurance covers that as well. So you really just need to use your insurance as much as possible when you're doing your recovery. And also, um, you know, a lot of doctors will say, here, take this Zoloft, take this pill, take this medication, and you'll be better in six weeks. And then you go through the trial and error of medication. I would say, please don't be afraid of medication. Sometimes you need medication to get through this. And a lot of people are afraid to take it. And so I would just say that medication can save your life sometimes, and it can turn the lights back on and bring the sun back out, but it has to be the right one. So there is trial and error with that. And sometimes you, that's why you have to find the best providers you can, because they're going to have to go through that journey with you as well. But it can be very helpful if you're given the right one. So don't be afraid of medication because sometimes it's necessary. 100%. Thank you for touching on that. I don't think we touched on that enough. Um, so like Lagaya said, in terms of advocating for yourself, just know that it is a journey and don't feel alone in this journey. And I know that Lagaya and I are always here. If you're ever struggling or you have someone in your life that is struggling, that may need somewhere or some place to start and just need some extra support, you can always reach out to us. We're always here for you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you both for giving your time. I know we're a little bit past six here, but before we go, um, there's just a little bit of praise here. There's some people saying, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Amy says, thank you. Um, great job, Lagaya, with a heart, eyes, smile emoji. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. So we really appreciate Shivani and Lagaya for giving your time and energy to share about this topic that needs destigmatization of uh, anxiety, postpartum anxiety and depression. So again, we will send out those resources in an email so you'll have them and you can share them um, with anybody else that needs them. Uh, we will be back next month. We'll have another Care Together before the end of the year. Um, it'll be coming together in a pol polarized world and interfaith discussion. So look for that. And we'll be promoting that soon. And if there's any questions that you have or anything you want to look at for NAMI Orange County, we can always go to our website at namioc.org. Uh, we have classes. We have other forums like this. And we also have a resource line called the Warm Line. It's open 24 hours a day that you can call if you need support or resources as well. So you can go get that information at our website at namioc.org. And again, um, thank you all for coming and we will see you next month.